Hey guys, welcome back to the next lecture. In this one, we are going to take a look at the common post-op complications. So let's dive in and let's start with the immediate peri or post-op fever. Now, this is a fever that begins either while the patient is still in the OR or a few hours after surgery. Now, the causes of immediate peri or post-op fever include infections that were present prior to surgery, which are now presenting as fever interoperatively or shortly post-op. Now, for example, if a patient has an infected kidney stone and is receiving percutaneous uh, nephrolithotomy, or they have appendicitis and they're going an appendectomy, they may have a fever during surgery due to an already pre-established infection. Now, the presence of inflammation either present before surgery, associated with the presence of trauma or burns, or directly caused by surgery, can cause an immediate post-op fever. Now, the trauma that's inflicted by cutting and burning tissue, which of course is inherent in surgical procedures, can cause tissue damage. This damage can, of course, release pro-inflammatory factors. Patients may also be undergoing surgery due to trauma or burns, again, causing the release of these pro-inflammatory factors. Now, these factors then stimulate cytokines. This ultimately stimulates fever. Now, the next cause of immediate peri or post-op fever, which is a medical emergency, is malignant hyperthermia. Now, in our psych lectures, there's a lecture on serotonin syndrome, neuro neuroleptic malignant syndrome, and malignant hyperthermia. Be sure to review those if you want more detailed information on any of those topics. All right, I bunched them together in those videos to make it easy for you to review. Now, finally, the last cause of immediate peri or post-op fever are medications or transfusion reactions. Now, these are immune-mediated reactions. The most common drugs responsible for fever interoperatively are going to be your antibiotics. This drug fever will typically begin shortly after administration, often shortly after the incision is made, and the fever will abate after the discontinuation of the drug. Next up, we've got early post-op fever. This is seen from day zero to three post-op. And many of the causes we see in immediate peri post-op fever can also be seen as causes of fever during this period. Now, these include infections that were present prior to surgery and inflammation that was there before surgery or that was caused during surgery. Additionally, there's a few other causes we need to be aware of. Now, one is a UTI. And this is especially likely if a urinary catheter was placed, especially if that placement was emergent and a sterile technique may not have been closely observed. A UTI is also more likely the longer the catheter is kept in place. So consider this if the patient had a chronic indwelling catheter in place prior to surgery. Now, in the case of a UTI, look for pyuria, bacteria, uh, suprapubic pain, flank pain, and or CVA tenderness on exam. Patients here are going to require antibiotic treatment for that UTI, and urine culture should also be obtained because we want to determine the susceptibility. Now, depending on how sick your patient is, empiric antibiotics will be given first, and then we'll narrow this based on what the culture grows. Another cause of early post-op fever is infection of the surgical site with either group A strep or Clostridium perfringens. Now, if another pathogen is involved, the site is usually infected five or more days after surgery. So that's an important detail to keep in mind. Now, identifying surgical site infection as a cause of fever is often clinical with visual inspections, uh, identifying edema, erythema, drainage, and or induration, very important. Wound exploration and debridement, often requiring serial debridement and dressing changes, as well as antibiotics, are going to be the treatment of choice in this scenario. Additionally, imaging can help us to confirm the depth of infection. Then we have pneumonia. Pneumonia is usually going to occur within a week of surgery, with the highest incidence occurring on day two. Now, in addition to fever, findings that are consistent with post-op pneumonia include cough, purulent sputum, respiratory distress manifesting as dyspnea, tachypnea, hypoxemia, possible hypercapnia, elevated white blood cell counts, and new infiltrates on chest radiograph. Now, treatment here is with empiric antibiotics that are given after a sputum sample is obtained, and then the antibiotics will be narrowed based on what the culture grows. Now, the last potential cause of fever at this stage is atelectasis. Now, there's not a lot of strong evidence for this in the literature, but it continues to be taught as a cause of post-op fever nonetheless. Now, incentive spirometry will be used here to encourage deep, expansive breaths to prevent atelectasis, and patients can be managed for atelectasis depending on whether they have no secretions, few secretions, or abundant secretions. Those without abundant secretions can benefit from continuous positive airway pressure, and those with a lot of secretions may benefit from chest physiotherapy and suctioning. Atelectasis incidence peaks from days zero to day two following surgery. So one of the things you want to keep in mind when it comes to this 
these post-op complications is what day are we in? If you know what day we're in, so when you're studying, I would say create a column of days and then what you expect to see in those days. That'll help you narrow things down real quickly when it comes to vignette time. All right, now let's talk about the causes of late post-op fever. This is when fever occurs more than 72 hours post-surgery. Again, we have UTI as a possibility. Uh, we might also see DVTs or PEs as a possibility. And a DVT and PE commonly develops on post-op day four through five. Certain kinds of injury, including a total joint arthroplasty or replacement, are risk factors, as are patients requiring surgery due to major trauma or acute traumatic spinal cord injury. Now, the prevention of DVTs and PEs post-op will include early mobilization, the use of SCDs, and anticoagulants, typically heparin. Now, infection of the surgical site, I mentioned this earlier as an early cause of post-op fever, but it is really just those two pathogens that can cause such an early development of infection at that surgical site. Remember, I said if it is within the first couple days, think about those two. Normally, surgical site infections are going to present four or more days after surgery. So keep that in mind. Now, the type of infection that's present at the surgical site really depends on the type of surgery that the patient underwent. So for example, in the case of surgery of the GI tract, gut bacteria may be causative, may be causing the, um, the infection at the surgical site. If we're doing, let's say, a squamous cell carcinoma removal, then skin flora would be the most likely organism that you're going to find there. Surgery-specific causes of late post-op fever are also possible. After doing upper abdominal surgeries, keep in mind that pancreatitis with fever can develop. After abdominal surgery, a deep abdominal abscess can develop as well. That can lead to fever. Uh, after vascular surgery, ischemia and fever can result from arterial embolization. Any type of device, graft, or prosthetic implant that we insert during surgery can, of course, harbor bacteria. That can lead to infection and fever as well. So you can see there's a ton of surgery-specific considerations that we want to keep in mind. Finally, medications or transfusions that we give during this time can also result in fever. Now, there's a simple mnemonic that I want you to remember that we can use to remember the post-op causes of fever, the five W's. The first W stands for wonder drugs, meaning virtually any drug could cause fever as a side effect. But the ones that are typically implicated are antibiotics, heparin, and H2 blockers. These drug reactions can occur at any time during the peri or post-op period. The next W stands for wind, which represents atelectasis. Now this presents most often post-op days zero through two and pneumonia post-op day two through three. The next W is water. This stands for UTI, often presenting post-op day three through four. Walking represents DVT and PE. Now PE is not part of the wind W. Uh, it is part of the walking W. DVT and PE, you're most commonly going to see this between days four and five. And finally, W, uh, the last W is wound. This represents, of course, infections of the surgical site. This most oftentimes presents on post-op days four or later. We just talked about all those. All right, so remember the five Ws. Next up, we've got post-op urinary retention. Now, this occurs when following a procedure, the patient has dysfunctional voiding despite having a full bladder, resulting in an elevated post-voidal residual volume. So the bladder is not emptying properly in this scenario. Risk factors that are going to increase the risk or the likelihood of post-op urinary retention include operative factors like implementing over 750 milliliters of fluid during the uh, surgery, uh, anticholinergic medications being used. Commonly, this will include glycopyrrolate as an adjunct to reversal of residual neuromuscular blockade. Surgeries that last over two hours increase the risk of this, as do certain types of surgeries like radical pelvic surgery. Finally, if we use a regional anesthesia, that can, of course, increase the risk of post-op urinary retention as well. Spinal and epidural anesthesias are common causes, as the anesthesia blocks afferent and efferent action potentials on the nerve fibers to and from the bladder. That can lead to a decreased urge to void. Now, patient factors can also play a role. With age over 50 years, having pre-existing urinary retention, as well as a history of pelvic surgery, all being contributive risk factors. Other causes of post-op urinary retention include sensory and motor causes. Patient may not be able to sense a full bladder due to anesthesia or nerve injury, either from patient positioning or direct surgical injury. The motor component may be dysfunctional due to pre-existing urinary retention, or once again, the effects of anesthesia or nerve injury. Urethral obstruction can be seen as well, and this could be functional uh, and due to uh, failure of the pelvic floor to relax, or mechanical with things like a mass, pelvic organ prolapse, or foreign bodies. Those are all possible causes.
Signs of post-op urinary retention will include the sensation of incomplete bladder emptying, needing to urinate again immediately after voiding, straining to void, having a weak stream, uh, position-dependent voiding, and or suprapubic pain or pressure. The diagnosis is made by measuring a post-void residual. Now, this is performed either with bladder catheterization or ultrasound. So what you're going to do is have the patient void, and then either the urine is collected and measured with catheterization, or an ultrasound is used to measure the volume of urine that remains in the bladder after micturition. Having over 100 mils of urine left in the bladder immediately after voiding would be seen in post-op urinary retention. Patients should have obstruction ruled out, of course, as the cause. And as far as treatment goes, we want to instruct the patient on how to perform sterile, clean, intermittent catheterization until their symptoms resolve to prevent bladder over distension. All right, last up is post-op nausea and vomiting. Now, patients more likely to experience post-op nausea and vomiting include female patients, non-smokers, patients with a history of motion sickness or prior post-op nausea and vomiting, and any patient who needs post-op opioids. So you want to try and prevent post-op nausea and vomiting, uh, and luckily we have several prophylactic medications we can give. We have transdermal scopolamine patches. Uh, we can give IV dexamethasone. We can give IV on Dancitron, especially if patients have three or more risk factors for post-op nausea and vomiting. Now, sometimes if we know that a patient going into surgery has an extremely high risk of severe post-op nausea and vomiting, then we can actually adjust the anesthesia plan to avoid volatile anesthetics which are the ones that are going to be the main causes of this condition. And instead, we can provide the patient with general anesthesia using a continuous propofol infusion. Alternatively, for some surgeries, we can avoid general anesthesia entirely and instead use regional anesthesia. Both of these measures should greatly reduce the risk of post-op nausea and vomiting. It really is just a, a patient-specific uh, decision, and we're going to you know, take it based on what's best for the patient, and also what's best to make sure they get a positive outcome. All right, let's do some co uh, content review questions here. Here is your first question. I put 20 seconds on the clock. Once you get the answer, come on back. Correct answer here is C. Next question, 20 seconds on the clock. Once you got the answer, come on back. Correct answer here is B. One more question. 20 seconds on the clock. Once you got the answer, come on back. Correct answer here is D. All right, guys, that's the end of this lecture. I will see you on the next one.